This is CTV's W5. Here is Lloyd Robertson. Welcome to W5. It isn't a new idea. Police use it as a tool to intercept online sexual predators. And one television network in the United States has used the technique to expose those who try to arrange sexual encounters with underage children. And for the past six months, W5 has been conducting its own undercover investigation, a sting operation, if you will, designed to flush out those who would prey on the most vulnerable members of society. What you are about to see may shock you. If you have always thought your child is safe, somehow immune from becoming one of the growing number of victims of Internet luring, you may want to think again. As Alan Fryer reports, predators come from all walks of life, and it doesn't take them long to latch on to what they hope will be an easy catch. She's only 12, we'll call her Katie, and she's waiting for a man she's met only online. He looks nervous, and with good reason. He's about to break the law by showing up to have sex with an underage girl. And he's not alone. Many others who lurk in teen chat rooms on the internet have also found what they believe are 12 or 13 year old girls and will come to this house for the same thing. Using internet names like Yamaha Man, Bulldog 8777, and David Toronto, they befriend the girl, show interest in her, but before long the talk turns to sex. I'd like to be your first, writes Yamaha Man, and it gets more explicit, more disgusting from there. Talk that would both frighten and infuriate any parent. Online, he's cautious, aware of the consequences of getting caught. You have to promise to keep this between you and me. David Toronto, too, makes it clear what he wants from the young girl and promises to bring along alcohol, cigarettes, and porn to get her in the mood. Believing the girl is home alone, each of the men suggests a get-together, her place for sex. Former Ontario Provincial Police Detective Rob Nichols says the internet has become prime hunting ground for sexual predators. One in four children online, so 25%, have been approached by somebody who wants to meet them or wants more information or uh, uses sexual content in that chat. One in four. That's huge. And he should know. Nichols spent seven years as an undercover officer tracking online predators, and he wrote a book about it. The biggest reason why it is such a threat online with predators is they can build that bond with children quickly, very quickly. Uh, they know the right buttons to hit, too. That's the other thing you have to understand about anybody whose sexual interest is children. I mean, they study this stuff. Yamaha man and David Toronto think they've found what they've been looking for, that vulnerable child willing to meet a stranger. But no child waits to greet them in this house. Katie isn't a person at all. She's an imaginary character who exists only in cyberspace. No, there's no child in this house, just a W-5 crew and seven hidden cameras. It's the culmination of months of work to see for ourselves how many predators are lurking on the internet, and hopefully meet some of them. Here's some, just, uh, some guidelines that I thought you could look at so far as online chatting. And this is how we started. Never say or do anything you wouldn't want to repeat to a jury. W-5 hired New Hampshire police detective Jim McLaughlin, a specialist in internet undercover operations, to train a group of university criminology students posing as underage decoys, just as he's been training police officers from across North America for the past eight years. Remember we talked about not having any sexual history. 
not getting involved in talking as filthy as they're going to. Every activity that occurs, we want to memorialize it and date the file. Our decoys have to get it right. They have to make it clear they're only 12 or 13 years old. They can never be the first to raise the subject of sex or getting together for sex. All of that has to come from the predator himself. Uh, Each student table, decoy assumes a persona, a fictional character, but I mean, one that's built on reality, an actual neighborhood in Toronto, a real school. You can say, okay, I'm in seventh grade, pick out a curriculum and have those teachers available right on your desktop for your character. Know the school mascot. Class is over. Our decoys get to work. Signing on to teen chat rooms, places where predators also lurk. In just a few hours, six grown men are lined up to visit 12-year-old Katie or 13-year-old Jenny, all with the same intention. Typically, do they say, you know, I'm a 40-year-old man, or do they start off pre pretending to be a teenager? About half of the offenders that we come across initially pretend to be the age of the child that they're attracted to. Only after the relationship has been established do they then reveal who they truly are. Of course, they have to do so for that meet. That's just what happened to Katie Tarbox when she was 13 years old. She thought she was chatting to a 23-year-old man named Mark. She's 25 now, but the memories are still fresh. He was able to win over my trust and basically become, you know, my main confidant. And so he became like my best friend. And I, you know, felt like I needed to, to have him in my life to talk about, you know, to, to talk about these insecurities, to talk about, to be there for me. And, um, and he certainly was that. But her cyber soulmate wasn't 23 at all. He was 41 and his name wasn't Mark. It was Frank Kufrovich, an investment banker from California. When Katie told him she was going to Dallas, Texas to compete in a swim meet, the man she knew as Mark showed up at the same hotel and invited her to his room. Tell me what happened when you came face to face with him. When he first opened up his hotel room door, I thought to myself, oh my gosh, you know, he's an adult. Was this making you uncomfortable? I imagine it would have been. I was just, I mean, just very passive and numb. I really didn't know, I, I just really wasn't processing, you know, anything that, that, was, that was going on. Um, and I did think to myself, you know, I've, I've got to get out of here. What was his end game? His end game was to, to rape me. He said to me, Katie, I've been thinking about you all day and I've been thinking about doing this. And that's, you know, when he leaned over, basically got on top of me, kissed me, groped me. Um, essentially, I was molested. Molested, but not raped. Katie's mother, who was traveling with her, found out just in time where she was and called the police. In one of the first ever internet luring cases, Kufrovich pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 18 months in jail. That incident took place in the U.S. more than 10 years ago, but since then, the trend both there and here in Canada has continued to grow. And W5 found no shortage of men eager to have sex with a minor that met online. As they approach the house where they think they're going to be meeting a young child for sex, are they anxious, are they nervous, are they... Are well, they extremely anxious, their heart's beating, they're breathing rapidly, they're sweating uh, as they approach that door because they don't know what's on the other side of the door. He's been chatting online with a girl he thinks is 12 and he suggested they meet for sex. Hey. I'm on my way, hold on. And he believes that today the girl is home alone. Our 22-year-old student decoy, posing as a 12-year-old, lets him in. Take your shoes off. I'll be right back. He's 36-year-old Ron Thompson, known online as Yamaha Man. It's time for W5 to show its hand. Hey, Ron. Hello. How you doing? Pretty good. Can I have a seat for a minute? Yeah. 
And to our surprise, he does. Remember, he's here expecting to have sex with a 12-year-old girl. Who are you here to see? Pardon me? Who are you here to see? The owner of the house. Katie? Yeah. Is she the owner of the house, though? Do you know she's 12 years old? No. You've been chatting to her online. Yeah. 12-year-old girl. I didn't know that. It doesn't say that. It says it right here. I've got the chat logs. In fact, in the very first minute of her online chat with Ron, Katie tells him she's 12 from Toronto. Ron asks her, would you feel weird talking to an older guy? You came here to have sex with a 12-year-old girl? Is that right? No. But online, this is the sort of thing he was telling her. Why are you here? Because I was invited. I didn't know who she was. You know very well she's a 12-year-old girl. All you have to do is think of it like a lollipop? What kind of thing is that to say to a 12-year-old? I'm Alan Fryer from W5. Ron, we're doing a program on predators. Have you done this before, Ron? But Ron was done talking. And he was just the first. There were several no-shows, but in just five days of staffing our house, no fewer than six predators came calling. Hello? Hello, how are you? Including this man who called himself David Toronto. He calls from the street to make sure Katie is alone. I am in your front, front door, in your house, outside your house. Hey, David. Hi, sir. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm back. Can I have a seat for a minute? And again, he does. How are you doing? David said he's 24 years old. Yeah, good. What are you here for? Sorry? How come you're here? Oh, she's uh, calling me. She's calling you? Yeah. Do you know how old she is? Who? Katie, the girl you came to meet. She's 18? No, she told you she was 12. Oh, sorry. Did you know she was 12? Uh, no. Online, David says, you're so young. And Katie replies, I'm almost 13. I've got your chat logs. You knew she was 12. Oh, sorry about this. And you came to have sex with her, huh? No, no, no. Boy, it sure sounds like it from your chat logs. Again online, the chat was graphic with much talk about oral sex. I mean, look at that. That doesn't oh, sound no. like you don't want it. Oh, because for the first of this, and then after I, I don't want it. So you changed your mind? Yeah, changed your mind. So why did you come? So it's just that you just want to talk with me. That's it. You just wanted to talk to a 12-year-old? Yeah. Have you done this before? No, no, nothing. Do you think you have a problem coming to have sex no. with a 12-year-old girl? No, you don't I, see anything don't wrong with that? I know, I know. It's very... That's a very... Now, you said you were going to bring some booze and cigarettes and porn. Did you bring no, anything? No, nothing, nothing. You didn't bring I, anything, I huh? Nothing. Do you do this a lot? No, no. Because you even said, you even no. said in your chat, boy, you're very young. Sorry, sorry about this. Denials, regrets, and of all things, a gift that might flatter a young girl. That's it. What did you want to give her? Just this gift. What's in it? Just uh, perfume. Perfume. Yeah, that's it. Nothing. I don't have nothing, you know. Nothing. Okay. Well, maybe I'll give it to her. Thank you very much. Now. Thank you very much. But you know this is wrong. Oh, yeah. Have you heard of the show W5? W? W5. CTV. Oh. We're doing a story on no, no, people who come oh, to have sex with sir, young girls. Please, I'm sorry about this. I'm really very sorry because, you know. Oh. Do you think it's wrong? What you did? Uh, sorry about that. Okay. Also sorry was this man, Steve Parker. He came all the way from Hamilton, a one-hour trip by bus. Hey, Steve. How you doing? Pretty good. How are you? Good, thanks. Want to sit down for a couple of minutes? Sure. Thanks. 
no gifts from Steve, but he did expose himself online to a girl he believed was just 13. Not unusual for predators obsessed with sex. Why would you show something like that? She was curious. She was curious. I think I'm very well. Have you heard of CTV's W5? Yeah. Yeah, well, we're doing a story on people who, oh. you know, come out to have sex with young girls, underage girls. I feel like I've been busted. I'm sorry, sir. How many times have you done this before? None. What do you think your folks would think about this? Probably run my little neck. Yeah. I feel like I've been set up. Can't totally embarrass myself. I think I'm gonna leave. Well, you know, coming to meet 13-year-old girls to have sex is probably not a good idea, is it? No. I mean, why would you want to do that? No. I'm leaving now. I'm very sorry. Thank you. I want to public actually thank you for actually helping me out tonight. Why do you say that? Because I can see my error in my way right now. So you think you've learned a lesson from yes. this? Yes. So far, all our visitors claimed they were single. But not this man. When Brashan, an engineer from the Toronto suburb of Mississauga, showed up at our house... Have a seat for a couple of minutes? Yeah. He admitted he was a married man with name? two young children. Does your wife know you do this? I'm sorry. I don't spoil my uh, uh, married life. You spoke to me. How old are you? 34. You're 34. You know, the, the girl that you came to have sex with is 12 years old? Not really. She's like profile is 18, sis. No, no. She said, I, I have your chat logs, and she made it very clear that she was 12. Not sex, I mean, just I, I want to see her and then... That's not what you said here. Online, he asks, how old are you? And Katie replies, 12. Do you have sex before, he asks. No, says Katie. Have you ever thought that you might be damaging a 12-year-old girl? Do you ever think about what effect I know, this might have on the life I know. of a 12-year-old girl? I know. So, first time we chatted, that time I told yes. her, she said, at 12 years age is not a right age to this, all these things. It was, I advise her, you know, I mean, it's not right age, you know, so. Why are you here? I made a mistake, sir. I made a mistake. I admire it. I'm, I'm, so, look, I mean, I'm going to spoil my marriage life. I, I, I mean, I will, I will definitely do that the next time. I will stop all this thing. I promise you, sir. What does your wife do when you're online chatting with 12-year-old girls? She works in second shift, sir. She's, she's working shift work? She's working shifts, but on this night, he wasn't home with the kids. How old are your kids? Two and four. So, whole marriage life will spoil, sir. Please, sir. Please. Do you think maybe you should have thought of, about that before you showed up to have sex I with a 12-year-old girl? I know. I, 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 I mean, I, I, I agree with that. I chatted all this thing. I, I agree with that. I, uh, this thing about the physical. I mean, I, I came here to just meet her. I don't want to do anything. Mm -hmm. so. Didn't do anything. Couldn't do anything. Because the only tenant at this house was W5. But Katie Tarbox really did meet a man, a real-life online predator, and it damaged her in ways she never imagined. In fact, she says, she was victimized twice. When people hear my story, they would naturally assume that probably the hardest part in all of this was actually being in that hotel room and becoming a victim of this crime. Well, that to me is... I mean, while that was difficult and that was painful, it was really the aftermath um, of how I was treated as a victim going home to this small town where everyone knew. I basically developed a reputation as a Lolita when that certainly was not who I was. I was, you know, the good swimmer, the, you know, top of my class. An online Lolita, not the kind of reputation a parent would wish for their daughter. But how can parents guarantee it won't happen? The number one rule says former OPP officer Rob Nickel, keep the internet out of your child's bedroom.
if that computer's out in the open where the parents can always keep an eye on what's going on, uh, the risks are going to go down. There's no two ways about it. Nickel also recommends special software to monitor your child's online activity and watch out for any behavior that might strike you as strange. Some of the signs you might look for, late night phone calls. Are they online really late at night? You want to be careful about that. Are they, do you hear tapping at 3 in the morning thinking, why are they on the computer at 3 in the morning? Things out of the ordinary. Vigilance awareness. In the end, the only defenses against sexual predators prowling the internet in search of children. Now, a question you may be asking is, why weren't these people who showed up at the house arrested? Well, six months ago, when our investigation began, we invited police to participate. They declined. Most police forces now have their own special units dedicated to bringing Internet predators to justice. W5 has since offered to brief the police on the results of this investigation. And you can find more details about the making of this story, including some advice for parents, on our website at w5.ctv.ca. We'll be right back. Good morning and welcome back to CBC News Sunday. I'm Evan Solomon. And I'm Carol McNeil. Is there an epidemic of online predators? Last night, the CTV current affairs program W5 broadcast a program in which several Canadian men were caught striking up highly sexual online chats with someone they believed to be a young girl. The men then arrived at a house in the Toronto area hoping to meet the girl. But instead, they met a reporter and cameras. He has a case of perhaps Bud Light or something. The show is modeled after this one, Dateline NBC's long-running To Catch a Predator series. Did you bring protection? Yeah. The only bad news about that is you're probably not going to need that type of protection tonight. See, I knew this was going to be a setup. And it's okay for a 30-year-old man to come to a home where a 15-year-old girl is alone. Why? No, it's not okay. Are you married? Yes, sir. How's this going to go over at home? Not good. I'm 61. You're 61, so you're not in your 40s. Like no. Dateline often works with police departments on these segments. Do you know she's 12 years old? No. You've been chatting to her online. Yeah, but no police wanted to work with CTV uh, on its version. Right here I've got the chat logs. In fact, the Toronto police wrote a letter of complaint to CTV saying its program could jeopardize some police investigation. So, should television programs be trying to catch people like this or should it be left to the police? To talk about this, we're joined from Stanford, Connecticut by Chris Hansen, who you just saw in action on Dateline NBC's To Catch a Predator. He's also the author of a new book about sexual predators and how to protect your children. Hi, Chris. Good morning. Chris, first question, uh, why do you do this program? Well, I think it's important. Uh, just like we used hidden cameras and enterprising techniques when we exposed uh, sex tourism in Cambodia or child slave labor in the silk industry in India, we, we recognized uh, online predators as a problem and we turned these reporting techniques on that topic. And um, we continue to cover it because it continues to be a problem. You know, we, we don't do just one story on the war in Iraq or the war on terror or, or our energy consumption. We're not going to do just one story on, on the issue of online predators. Chris, how do you draw these men to you? Give us, an uh, give us an indication of how it works behind the scenes. We work with an online watchdog group called Perverted Justice, and, and its uh, contributors are very skilled at uh, posing as 12, 13, and 14-year-old boys and girls. And these people go into chat rooms um, with a, a profile that includes a picture that is unmistakably underage, and they basically sit there and wait. And within minutes sometimes, guys start, you know, hitting upon them. There will be a conversation. Sometimes this process takes, you know, weeks, sometimes a month. And, and a meeting is ultimately set up 
the man comes to the house that we have uh, wired with hidden cameras and, and uh, microphones, um, and I confront the man. We have a conversation. In our most recent investigations, uh, law enforcement has run a parallel investigation. Uh, it has the information, the chat logs, and, and everything that we get separately. And when the man leaves, he's then arrested and, and prosecuted for um, online solicitation of a minor. Chris, give us an idea of how big this problem is. They've talked about an epidemic of predators, how prevalent it is uh, in the United States. Well, you know, in our experience, I mean, I can tell you this, we've done this investigation ten times now. And each time we do it, we still get guys showing up, dozens of guys showing up, many of whom have seen our previous investigations. Sometimes they even reference uh, seeing the shows in their chat. Statistics, hard statistics, are difficult to come by because a lot of these incidents go unreported and there's no real way for the Justice Department to monitor this online activity. I can tell you that from child advocates uh, we've worked with, uh, as many as 25 percent of 14-year-olds have actually gone to a meeting in person with somebody they met online. So how, so what happens to these people? And I've watched your show. There's these incredibly dramatic confrontations that you have with these people who are doing something obviously completely inappropriate. What happens to the people that end up on that television show? In the um, two and a half years we've been doing it, uh, some 228 men have been arrested. The first two investigations we did solo. We didn't have uh, the police doing a parallel investigation, so not each and every one of the men who showed up got arrested. But, but starting with the third investigation, each man who came in uh, was arrested, 228 prosecuted. Probably half of those have already worked uh, their way through the court system and have been either convicted, pleaded guilty, or pleaded no contest. The sentences have ranged from probation and registration as a sex offender all the way up to six and a half years in prison. The other half of the men are still working their way through the court system. Nobody has gone to trial and been found not guilty, and nobody has had all the charges dismissed uh, for, for any reason. Okay, Chris, so you work with the police on this issue right now, right? Well, it... it Yes and no. I, I, the police run an independent parallel investigation. Uh, we are careful to preserve our independence as journalists covering the story. And obviously the police don't want to be a tool of, of the media. So, so we keep a, a protective wall between the two operations during, during the time of the investigation. Okay, we'll explore a little bit more about that. But we're going to get another view on this from Colin Adams, who is a defense lawyer. And he joins us from Toronto. Mr. Adams, uh, what's your impression of the CTV program and the original program that it's based on, which is to catch a predator? I'm rather saddened that the CTV program is, as is so often the case, a pale imitation of the American one, but I'm rather gladdened because I thought the American program, the Dateline program, was itself obscene and pornographic and pandered to the worst instincts of the American viewing public. How so? Um, it, it's socially useful to publish a book on how to uh, street-proof your child or keep your child from falling into an internet trap situation. It is not socially useful to brutalize emotionally and physical these sad human beings who you've managed to attract into this situation. And when I say brutalize, when Chris Hansen stands there looking for all the world like a policeman and using police jargon, I need you to take a seat for me, sir, uh, and, and torturing this man with unanswerable questions that are clearly causing him emotional and psychological distress, that's brutalization. When he goes outside and becomes the subject of a high-risk takedown, he gets, I think in one case, tasered, unless I misread uh, what I was seeing. I Did was you get tasered, Chris, at one point? No, I've never been tasered. Uh, we've had two incidents where um, men have left the house and not stopped for police, and in those two incidents, the police used a, a, a taser to, uh, to right. make okay. the arrest. Yes. Okay. Or another one, a policeman ran up, used a low retaining wall as a springboard, leapt into the air, and took the man down from the back of his neck. Um, that's brutalization. Now, I think an enormous number of the viewing public will say, and rightly so too, these are terrible, terrible people. It's not the job of the private sector to do that. It's completely and utterly wrong. I'm very, very glad, and it embarrasses me to be in agreement with Metropolitan Toronto Police Force, because I very rarely am, but I'm very glad that they haven't chose to ally themselves with this. In fact, I just want to let our audience in on that. The Toronto Police Department did send a letter to uh, the CTV program saying that they, not only did they disagree that they were doing the program, but also so there's sort of a veiled warning that they could be in contravention of the law. Having 
having said that, Chris, what do you? What's your response to what Colin just said that uh, about the, his criticisms of your show and what you're trying to do? Well, that's his interpretation, and he's certainly uh, entitled to it. I would say that. Uh, you know, I'm there to, to initiate a dialogue with these guys. I mean, I don't beat them up. I don't punish them. I'm not the police. You know, I'm reporting on a continuing story. And, and I think if you look at all of these cases, yes, you'll see some uncomfortable moments. And I, I'll leave that up to, to the viewer and, and others to decide whether that's appropriate or not. But I will tell you this, in many more cases, we see guys talk about their issues the events in their lives that brought them to this house and I see sometimes that these guys actually feel relieved some of these interviews turn into virtual therapy sessions because I think these guys really are, are, are at a point where they know they've had obsessions and compulsions online and, and they've decided to act on them or maybe have acted on them several times but finally they're going to address these issues Colin, what about your response? Uh, I mean, when you see Chris Hansen's stuff and, and, and what happened on W5, I mean, the public is getting a real sense of what's really going on out there, and there is opening the doors on this very dark place. As a parent, you know, it can be very uh, eye-opening. What's your response to that? Yes, if you do a documentary informing the public of the prevalence of it, that's fine. But what the viewing public is turning their TV on in this case is to see these people brutalized, and that panders to the voyeurism and the sadism that's perhaps inherited in our culture. I myself am looking forward to the end of Conrad Black's trial for much the same reasons. Let me put it this way. If you've got a plague of rats, rats are disgusting, they eat feces and corpses, we want to get rid of the rats, let's teach people to police their garbage and uh, put out traps. There's another alternative. We can light a bonfire and have people throw live rats into it. And I think that at least a solid element of the Dateline show is throwing well, rats into bonfires. Well, well Chris, is there, is there an element of exploitation here, vigi vigilantism, that this is really the job of the police, and that guys like you are, are in some sense exploiting this, as Colin suggested? How, how do you respond to that? That's, that's not my position on it. I mean, when you do investigative reporting and you confront people who are doing bad things, there are going to be uncomfortable moments, as there were last week when we exposed people involved in these Internet financial scams. Um, we tracked them down. I sat across from a table. A man had sweat pouring out of his face. But had I been a real investor, I would have been taken for tens of thousands of dollars. Next week, credit card fraud, identity theft. We do the same thing. We confront these people and hold them accountable. Colin, let yes, me... sometimes that, that's uncomfortable, but it's, it's part of what I do for a living. It's, it's important, I think. Colin, let me ask you this. The damage that child predators do to children and future adults is horrific. I think everybody would agree with that, no? Yes, uh, it's a broad term, child predator, but go on. Right. And my, my, I'm asking you this. The more that we, in the media, the police, the courts, can put a spotlight on this publicly to let people know what's going on, the more pressure might be on police to become more aggressive in their pursuit of child predators. Might that not be a benefit to society? I don't think you could put any more pressure on the police than already exists. Metropolitan Toronto Police Force has shown enormous and proactive activity in this area. The efforts of Paul Gillespie, who I think led the continent in the fight against child pornography, is one example. He's now gone over to the private sector. But I don't think you're going to achieve anything by putting pressure on the police. Give them a bit more budget, maybe. Um, give them access to more technological resources. Recruit, as indeed Paul Gillespie did. Um, Bill Gates to sell him some software or give him some software to assist in it. That's all very good. But this business of um, basically putting people in the pillory, I don't think really helps at all. Let, let, let me just get proactive as a parent here for a second. Chris, uh, you've written a book on this. What uh, advice can you give to parents to, uh, and Colin raised the issue of street-proofing the kids, what, what things have you learned there for, for parents to watch out for? Well, we've talked to uh, you know child advocates. I've looked into the eyes of 250 of these guys. We've talked to law enforcement. We've talked to a lot of smart people, psychiatrists, and we've been able to get into the mind of, of a potential predator. And when you do that, you have a better sense of how to protect your child. Several things you can do. Some of them as simple as limiting the amount of time your child is on the internet. If your child knows he or she has one or two hours a day, they will get down to the business of downloading music, chatting with their friends, and checking the movie schedule for 
for the weekend, and that is less time loitering in a chat room or in a place where they can be approached by a potential predator. It, it, the other thing that's important, you know, our parents told us don't talk to strangers, don't take rides from strangers. Well, the definition of stranger has changed because some of these people are so skilled at grooming and removing these barriers with your child that, that, that they need to know that, that guys are out there doing this sort of thing. I mean, I read these transcripts and, and they all follow a template. You know, I was that way too, I, I, you know, homework's terrible, you know, my parents were strict on me, and they make these friendships and the kids need to be aware that this is going on. All right, to both of you, uh, Chris Hansen and Colin Adams, thanks for discussing this. This is obviously a big issue, and just how to deal with it remains controversial. Nonetheless, you both shed some light on this for us this morning. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So what do you think? We'd like to hear your thoughts on all the stories we bring you. Should shows like to catch Predator be on? Or some of the other stories that we brought you this morning. You can write to us at CBC News Sunday, Box 500, Station A, Toronto, Ontario, M5W1E6. Our email address is sunday at cbc.ca. And online, we're always available. The website address is cbc.ca slash sunday.